Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Lily McGuire. Uh, Dr. McGuire is an assistant professor in the Department of General Surgery, and she was going to be speaking on the genetic basis of diverticulitis. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? I got That's it? That's correct. I, I practiced okay, that, okay? so thank you. Okay. Uh, it was my pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to give a very different talk from Dr. Willer. Um, I'm primarily a clinician, and I'm a clinical collaborator in the lab with Dr. Elizabeth Spiliotis. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot about the phenotype, which is when I operate on a lot, which is diverticulitis. This is a very common colorectal disease. Um, the precursor lesion, which you can see is outpouchings of usually the left side or sigmoid colon, is ubiquitous and present in essentially uh, 60 to 70 percent of the older uh, European and North American population. A small fraction of these people go on to have diverticulitis, which um, is defined by inflammation and superinfection of these outpouchings. This can present as left lower quadrant pain, fevers, and progress on to free perforation of the colon, peritonitis, and sepsis, uh, which is generally where I get involved. I study diverticulitis because it's common and morbid. The incidence is increasing. It's increasing particularly rapidly in younger individuals under the age of 40. Our traditional etiologic theories, which are entirely environmental, appear to be overly simplistic and really don't explain the spectrum of disease that we see. Our standard treatments are under scrutiny. Um, to the point where our randomized controlled trial of standard medical therapy has shown no benefit over placebo. And our surgical decision making is personalized with no ability of us to uh, uh, risk stratify our patients in terms of who will go on to have uncomplicated course of diverticulitis, never present again, versus who will go on to perforate their colon, have severe disease, and ultimately require surgery for further prevention. This is where the space where I really get excited because there's clear cut clinical decision making that's really under-informed by our current risk stratification models. I also study diverticulitis because it's really understudied. And compared, this uh, slide is probably about a year old in terms of grants and hits on PubMed, but compared to other benign, uh, common colorectal diseases, diverticulitis is incredibly understudied, especially based on the fact that it generates nearly a quarter of a million admissions to the hospital every year, and probably about 12 to 20 percent of those patients will go on to ultimately require surgery. Diverticulitis has for a long time been thought as a purely environmental disease, that Americans and Western Europeans eat a low fiber diet, they develop diverticular disease, and then spontaneously develop diverticulitis. And therefore, the heritable um, aspect of this really hasn't been studied until about 2013, when some well-designed twin studies indicated that perhaps anywhere from 40 to 53 percent of our risk um, is due to genetics, and therefore we can think of diverticulitis as a complex trait. I'm going to talk about how we used MGI in the service of this disease. And the first was using it as a replication cohort um, in a GWAS for diverticulitis. Our discovery cohort, which I'm sure is familiar to everybody in the room, was the United Kingdom Biobank. There's uh, nearly 29,000 patients um, in the UK Biobank who have diverticular disease, coded as an uh, admitting diagnosis for an inpatient admission. And due to the Western European um, and the age range, 40 to 60, of the participants within the UK Biobank, essentially all of them can be thought of as controls given the ubiquity of the precursor lesion. So we performed a standard GWAS using the UK Biobank, and we used MGI um, as our replication cohort. Uh, we identified 40 genome-wide significant loci, including three that have been previously seen in the smaller Scandinavian GWAS. And you can see our results here. We went ahead and replicated that in the Michigan Genomics Initiative, and the phenotyping here is not exactly one-to-one. -one. We'll talk about how we're going to surmount that a little bit later. Um, but we did find replication of nine of our 40 loci within the Michigan Genomics Initiative. These 42 loci mapped to 99 genes. Oops, sorry. And in picking my sort of favorite genes here, um, some of them were particularly interesting based on the mechanism of action either involved in immunity, the extracellular matrix, membrane transport and signaling, or intestinal motility. Unlike many of the other diseases that will be presented here today, uh, the molecular biology of diverticulitis is essentially in its infancy, having only really been studied for the past like, five to ten years, and therefore this presented a lot of new avenues for further research. However, what really gets me excited is how can we use the MGI to further subphenotype patients, to identify patients who are at really critical clinical decision-making steps that can't be appreciated in larger de-identified biobanks, and to employ genetics um, and to employ the data in the MGI to attempt to solve some of the questions that come up in risk stratification, particularly for diverticulitis. So a standard patient, um, age 60 um, and over, has a greater than 50 percent chance of harboring diverticulosis. 
we have no idea who of those people will go on to develop diverticulitis. So the first star here, we have an opportunity to predict for a standard patient undergoing a screening colonoscopy whether or not they might develop diverticulitis, and therefore whether they could adopt any lifestyle changes such as weight loss, physical activity, or increasing their fiber uptake that if we applied that to the general population would be totally useless, but might be really helpful to people at higher genetic risk. Secondarily, when a patient gets diverticulitis, they may contemplate whether to undergo major surgery as a form of secondary prevention. At this point, our recommendation is to individualize a conversation with a patient. And what that means is we essentially have no clinical risk stratification. There's no lab test, CT scan, colonoscopy, um, or set of physical parameters that can allow us to identify which patients are going to run a benign course and never have another episode, and which are going to run a severe course and wind up needing surgery. Therefore, we have overtreatment, where some patients undergo major surgery and they will never suffer an attack ever again. And we have undertreatment, where some patients um, will undergo multiple attacks before undergoing an eventual inevitable surgery. So a really clear-cut area, two separate phases of the disease course, to use potentially new data help us risk stratify our patients and select the appropriate treatment for them. This is a little bit hot off the press, and so it's very preliminary. I think this data is from like a week ago. But we use, the way we're using MGI now is to identify patients with subphenotypes of diverticular disease that we could never identify using a de-identified biobank. So we have asymptomatic patients, and we want to be careful how we define those. Unlike UK Biobank, where essentially everyone's a Northern European, 40 to 60 years old, and therefore harbors the precursor lesion, the MGI is um, a much more diverse population, younger population, and a surgical sample. Therefore, we identified asymptomatic patients as those who acquired a diagnosis of diverticular disease on the day of a colonoscopy and never went on to have a billed visit for diverticulitis. We identified patients with mild disease as those with one inpatient or innumerable outpatient visits for diverticulitis, but never underwent surgery or percutaneous drain placement, which are some of our more common interventions. And we identified our severe phenotype as people who either were admitted to the hospital more than once, who underwent surgery, or who needed a percutaneous interventional radiology procedure to deal with a contained perforation of diverticulitis. What's nice is we also obtained um, uh, EHR access to all of these, and we've um, gone through and subphenotyped all of these patients and done a thorough chart review on them. So we can also appreciate factors that can't be um, essentially extracted from um, ICD-10 coding, such as like extent of disease, extent of surgery, um, and uh, different factors like immunosuppression, smoking status, BMI, et cetera. So we can really bring this into utility in a clinical context when we're looking at a whole patient. So we've poly done polygenic risk scoring in two settings and have, at least at this point, very preliminary but significant signals. Um, we do have a significant finding of, uh, for polygenic risk scoring from diverticulosis to diverticulitis, which again could be useful potentially in predicting who might go on to have um, a disease at all. And then looking at severity and trying to determine who might go on to have more severe disease and maybe come up with a clinical risk prediction tool, we also have a significant signal. Again, very early days, and happily we have a third cohort um, at collaborators at Vanderbilt and Penn who are willing to help us refine this. So very early, hot off the press data, but at least interesting and at least seeing a signal. Finally, um, I think it's important as a clinician to not just impose tools upon the clinical world, but to understand how they will be enacted into clinical practice. And so to do that, we want to understand how people are making decisions in a data-free zone. When I'm seeing a patient in my office or my colleague across the state is seeing a patient in his office, in terms of when to perform a major surgery in a risk prediction-free zone, how do we make that decision? And in order to understand that, we've performed qualitative interviews with surgeons in academic, private, um, and military practice throughout the country to determine some baseline decision factors. We've also harnessed the power of the MGI to recontact patients to perform focus groups and structured interviews. And when we have our polygenic risk score refined and up and running, um, we're collaborating with Lisa Prosser, um, who's also here in the School of Public Health, to perform discrete choice experiments and understand when and how a polygenic risk score or genetic tool uh, could be applied most appropriately to the patient. Um, so in summary, diverticulitis is a very common disease. We're operating in a risk-free zone where or a risk stratification uh, free zone where clinical factors have failed to predict disease severity or guide us in how we select the appropriate choice for patients. We're hoping to use some of uh, the new data from MGI to subphenotype our patients and make better uh, uh, surgical and medical decisions. Our polygenic risk scoring, again hot off the presses, shows a little bit of early promise but needs much more refinement. And um, I strongly feel that any new genetic tools need to be pre-integrated into clinical context so they can actually be useful. <laughs>
Finally, thank you to so many people here, especially uh, Liz for taking on somebody totally new to this entire uh, field and helping them develop some uh, really raw ideas, and all the people in her lab, and especially Tuna Paris for helping us through some of the GUS uh, as well. Okay. Thank you. Questions? I thought it was a very interesting use case of how uh, a data set that's much smaller than the UK Biobank can actually have some additional information that you're able to use to, to that, that you couldn't get from UK Biobank and those additional features and your sub type. So very cool. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Oh, we have one question. Sir. How much time and effort went into the sub using um, disease course data? Uh, yes, that's a really good question. Um, so what I did basically um, was first to do a chart review. I paid my partner's niece, who's a high school student, uh, to get city training, and she spent three months of her summer uh, learning about diverticulitis and learning about genetics and coming to observe in the operating room. And so she spent eight hours a day for three months doing a thorough chart review, which was a really good use of um, you know, money for me in terms of startup funding and sponsored a young person interested in going into medicine. And then we realized quite quickly that in order to export that, we couldn't expect our collaborators at Vanderbilt and Penn to be doing that level of chart review without significant investment. So at that point, we just had to come up with a really easy phenotype like admissions, outpatient visits, or surgery. Um, and that was actually straightforward to do once we had the data pull from DataDirect. So that takes no time. All right, thank Great you again. Thing.